So um, this next discussion today is one that's out of the box. Um, for all of you who are our friends and supporters of WIDA, we are always talking about trade. And uh, it takes place in a political context. And we all speculate about what that what different trade policies will mean. Certainly, the president's team is very tuned into the politics of trade. It's been something that the president has been very focused on, as you all know. Not just, I would say, just since 2016. Um, for almost 30 years, he's been talking about trade. And, and it certainly seems like he has some pulse beat on uh, uh, how voters feel about trade. But what we have here today is a special guest. I'm going to invite um, Rich Thau. Uh, delighted uh, to have you come to Washington to give us this presentation. I'm going to ask Kimberly Ellis, a WIDA board member, uh, to please introduce Rich Thau. And uh, uh, thank you, Kimberly, for bringing him to our attention. Thank you. Um, thanks so much uh, for being here today. So Rich Thau, you may have seen him on CNN or heard him on the POTUS ch channel on SiriusXM, where he appears regularly. But Rich has two titles. One is his business title, um, where he's president of Engage Us. His firm specializes, specializes in message testing and message refinement for trade associations like the Ch U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, and International Franchise Association. But what he's going to talk, um, talk about today is his, uh, his other project, which is the Swing Voter Project. Rich just passed the midway point of a 21-month odyssey where he focuses on grouping Obama-Trump and Romney-Clinton swing voters in the upper Midwest. He's going to share with us his key findings from the project and talk about how these voters view trade policy, as well as the larger suite of issues uh, that matter to them. And it's going to answer the all-important question, which way will the voters swing this year, which is all the more important coming out of some of the uncertainties we, we, uh, we have seen uh, in Iowa over the last 24 hours. So after he finishes his presentation, we'll, we're going to have a discussion, and we'll, we'll take some questions as well. So thank you so much, and please join me in welcoming Rich. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Good. Get the blood flowing. I know after lunch, people start to nod off. I want to make sure I keep you awake for the next 55 minutes. It's great to be with you and honored to be here. Ken, thank you for having me. And Kimberly, thank you for that lovely introduction. So today I'm going to be talking about the all-important question, which way will swing voters swing? So I'm going to tell you about the project that I'm, in, in, I'm working on right now. And as you heard from Kimberly, it's a 21-month odyssey. It started in March of last year. It's running through November of this year. Our project partners are DialSmith, which is a division of my company that is doing the moment-to-moment -moment dial testing part of it, and I will show that to you in a little bit, and uh, Focus Point Global, which is one of the country's leading focus group companies. They are doing all the recruiting for us in all of these locations I'm about to tell you about. The methodology is a blend of focus grouping and moment-to-moment -moment dial testing. I'm going to share with you five trends. I've actually I got a few bonuses at the end I'm going to throw in for a good measure of what we learned in the first 11 months. And we've been watched closely from the beginning of this project. We actually have a partnership with Axios. Some of you might have seen the monthly stories about the Swing Voter Project there. Alexi McCammon, a reporter for Axios, is coming to each of the focus groups and writing them up. And then uh, it's gotten picked up in a bunch of other places as well. So where have we been so far? Well, you'll see there's a map of the upper Midwest color dar in, in darker uh, uh, hues. And we started in Appleton. We went to Bowling Green, Sioux City, Erie, and so forth. Uh, we're going February 18th is our next stop. We're actually going to Florida for our uh, winter getaway. We're doing Port St. Lucie, which is another swing county in uh, uh, southeastern Florida. So how did I know where to go? I didn't just make up which towns to visit. It wasn't done by a random choice. It was actually done somewhat scientifically. And it was done thanks to the uh, good people at CNBC who created this remarkable map right after the last election. It's a color-coded map. And the counties that are in dark red are the ones where there was the largest flip from Obama to Trump between 2012 and 2016. The map is really amazing, because when you use it on your computer and you go over any particular county, it will tell you what the ex election results were in each of those two elections so you can actually see what the differences were between 12 and 16. If you do a Google search for CNBC 2012 versus 2016, it'll come right up. And it's, it's been a remarkable resource. So we actually looked at each of those counties in dark red and the ones that had enough population to justify being able to go there and get a focus group together, we chose it. 
and that's how we determine where to go. Some of the counties are so sparsely populated, we couldn't get enough people into a focus group, but thankfully there are enough of them for us to do this project for 21 months. So why am I doing this? Why am I hauling myself from the East Coast to the Midwest and back to the East Coast once a month for, for such a long period of time? Well, there are three reasons. The first is, I was frustrated personally that the pollsters polled, but they didn't consistently listen. They weren't conducting the type of qualitative research that we're doing here that enables us to understand what people are truly thinking. And if you want to know what they're thinking, you should ask them. And not just ask them what, but ask them why. And that's what we're doing as part of this project. The second reason is that as an American, I feel it's important for us to have as few people shocked by the outcome of this election as possible. Certainly people will be surprised. Certainly they'll be disappointed. Certainly they'll be ecstatic. But being truly shocked by the outcome is something I think we should avoid because there's going to be enough contention in the country as it is over this election. And I found that obviously there were massive amounts of Americans shocked in 2016. And I just think it's not a good thing again. Those of you who watched the Super Bowl on Sunday, probably thought either team could have won that game. Right? It's a fair assertion. It was a close game. Either team could have won. I think we should have the same mindset going into the 2020 election, that either side could conceivably win this. You might be disappointed. Again, you might be overjoyed. But you shouldn't be shocked. And the third is, obviously, it's a chance for us to display our ability to uncover key insights. That's the third reason why we're doing this. So let me dive in and tell you what we found. First finding. These are low information voters. They don't get their news where you get yours. Okay? If you get your news here, those kinds of sources, you're not like the people I'm interviewing in those towns around the Midwest. Where do they get their news? They get it from local TV news, sports, weather, crime, and traffic. Those are the four things I get on my local news station outside Philadelphia. Here in DC, you get a little bit of a different kind of mix. You sort of get advertising on local stations that's politically oriented. But in the rest of the country, it's those four things. And by the way, outside Philly, the sports is just the Eagles. <laughs> okay? that, that is sports. And it doesn't matter whether it's football season or not. It's all 12 months of the year. They all, so these people get their, their news from local TV news sources. They get it from local websites of either those TV stations or independent sites. Some of them get their news from cable news. About a third of them or so get it from cable news. A lot of them get their news from Facebook. Some of them get their news from national morning TV shows like Good Morning America and The Today Show. And a number of them get their news from what I would call news aggregators. So what I mean by that are, well, let me tell you what happens. I, where do you get your news? I get it from my device. That's the answer. I get it from my device. Well, where on your device do you get it? Um, I'm not so sure. Maybe it's that Apple News thing or Yahoo News. So there's some confusion oftentimes as to what the news source is that's providing the news to the device that they're then reading. So again, they are generally low information voters. Let me play the first of several clips I have for you today where I'm asking people where they get their news. And you'll get a sense of, of what it sounds like. And where you get your, your news. I listen to Fox News. I listen to CNN. MSN and The Blade. Facebook and The Blade. Usually the debates and colleagues. The <coughs> Eleven News and Facebook. Detroit News, Detroit Free Press, and The Blade. Same thing. Reading The Washington Post. Go on Twitter, hear a couple of speeches. Facebook, Yahoo News, local news, podcast. CNN and Read The Blade and Facebook. Uh, ABC News. Local, national? Uh, mostly local. Uh, GoHarry.com and The Daily Mail. Do I get my news from Apple News? Uh, WKL and PBS. Just Google News. Oh, Google News. Okay, got it. Thank you. CBS and NBC uh, National News. ABC, CBS, uh, CNNs. And mostly from GoEerie.com and local news. Okay. Um, Channel 2, which is WBAY. Okay. It's all local news. I would say most of it's Channel 11. Fox 11 as well, local. NBC 26. Online through NBC 26. Um, channel 5, and I also read the Appleton Post Crescent. The local news, also Fox News. Local news, WFRV, WBAY. I watch Channel 11. Okay. Local. Great. That was our, by the way, the only all-female group that we did. We wanted to hear how women focused on some female-oriented issues that month talked about uh, those issues with us. 
But you can hear where the responses are. In that group in particular, almost all of them getting their news from local news. Stop and think for a second what your news consumption would look like if you had to rely solely on the kinds of news channels that they got their news from, and then what your perception of the world would look like if you got your news only from those sources. How vastly different it would be from what you're currently doing and what you would know as a result of taking your information in the way they take theirs in. So as a result of this, and there's a reason why, by the way, I made this the number one or the first of the key findings, because it drives so much else of what I'm going to tell you. So they don't know that much about the Democratic candidates, for example. So one thing that we do is we ask people to evaluate on a 0 to 10 scale how confident they are that they could identify official photos of each of the candidates running for president on the Democratic side. 0, they're not at all confident. 10, they are very confident. Let me show you what happened when we started asking about this last March. And this is from the first six months. So this is March through August. And you can see that Bernie Sanders scores close to 10, Joe Biden a little bit lower in the sevens, Elizabeth Warren in the fives, and everybody below that was under five. So these are folks, for the most part, are not confident that they could name most of the candidates. One of the things that stands out for me is this. Pete Buttigieg, you see, is, is less than two. That number hasn't shifted since this scale was generated after the August sessions. In other words, September through now, he's still scoring at ones or twos when we put a picture of him up on the screen. Again, if you're getting your news from WQZM in some small town, Pete Buttigieg isn't on your radar screen if he's not campaigning in your state. So there's a huge amount, again, that these folks don't know. But for comparison's sake, we asked about one other person. And she scores higher than all but three candidates. This was in August. So again, think about where people are getting their news, what they're hearing about. She has a higher level of familiarity than most of the people running on the Democratic side. The third thing is that Obama-Trump voters, for the most part, are still sticking with President Trump. So if you indulge me, I'm going to play a couple of clips that have me talking with Michael Smirkanish. And this is one that goes back to, to October, but it still holds true today. Here's another stunner from your data. As we said, some of these folks voted for Obama and then Trump. And you have a hypothetical. And, and you say, OK, you can pick one of the two of those. What's the result? So we ask a hypothetical in every focus group. And we've now done this over the course of, of eight months, eight separate focus groups. And, and we ask, if you could vote between Obama and Trump in next year's election, who would you choose? And over the course of the eight months we've done so far across the upper Midwest, roughly two-thirds, given that choice, would choose President Trump. But among the Obama-Trump voters we interviewed in Youngstown, all eight would stick with President Trump. It's unbelievable because, you know, I would think in that area, that blue-collar area where manufacturing jobs have gone away, he promised he'd bring them back. That hasn't happened. And yet, you're telling me they are still with the president. They are still with the president. They like his America First agenda. They like what he stands for, the way he pushes back on other countries. These are people who the president has won over, and they are still with him. So just to put some numbers around it, this is the aggregate of all 11 sessions when we've asked the question, who would you vote for in a hypothetical matchup between Obama and Trump in this year's election? And of the total of 89 people in that left coupling, 62 of them would stick with President Trump. Only 27 of them would go to former President Obama. The right coupling is among the Romney-Clinton voters. Who would they vote for? And almost all of them would go for President Obama. So the takeaway here, President Trump has won over the Obama-Trump voters. They really would pr strongly prefer him. But among the Romney-Clinton voters, he's barely done anything to persuade them to come to his side. Now look carefully at that 62 in that very first column. I'm going to show you the results of a second hypothetical we ask. If you could re-vote 2016, what would be the result? And that 62 now becomes 80. So again, there's, there's, there's more residual goodwill toward President Obama than there is toward Hillary Clinton among these voters. But still, President Trump, in this case in particular, President Trump wins it by an even, even larger margin. And among the Romney-Clinton voters, same result as before. They would take Hillary Clinton all over again. So 
I was curious about how these respondents felt about President Obama and, and, and Joe Biden. So you're going to see a little section of the highlight video we did after we finished the most recent session in Wilkes-Barre in early January. One thing that really surprised me is that there's not a lot of nostalgia for the Obama-Biden administration. How many of you, at the end of Obama's eight years, thought, you know what, I'm done with him? By a show of hands, how many of you kind of felt that way? His campaigning this year, his running around America on behalf of a Democratic candidate, whoever it happens to be, yes, how much weight is that going to carry for you? No, Zero. No. Zero. Because Joe Biden is from Scranton, I thought that the folks in this part of Pennsylvania might be feeling some sort of particular affinity toward Vice President Biden. Does anybody feel any, any particular warmth or affinity toward Joe Biden in this group? None of you. So what I'm hearing from you is there's no particular benefit to Joe Biden for being from Scranton, as no. far as you folks here in Wilkes-Barre are concerned. Well, the reason why is the fact that he really spent, what, eight years of his life? It was a very short period of time that he spent here. That when he was born and then yeah, moved. He was born here yeah. and then he moved to, to Delaware, Delaware. somewhere else. Exactly. It's not like he spent his whole life here. Okay. Next key finding. The outcome of this election hinges on the economy. President Trump's fate is tied directly to the economy. Many voters feel like they hired him because he's a businessman. If the, if the economy turns, they told me support for him is going to fade. And he's vulnerable on two pocketbook issues, health care and retirement security. This was a group that we did in August in suburban Minneapolis. How many of you have no idea what President Trump is doing on Social Security? Show of hands. Well, most of you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. When I asked you how satisfied you are with President Trump's efforts to ensure health care is affordable for you and your family, I got a score of 3.2 on average. He's made zero effort. He's even admitted he's made zero effort. If a Democratic candidate stood up and said, I have a plan to fix the health care system in the United States, President Trump had four years and he's done nothing. Is that a compelling message for you? If it's affordable, yeah. yes. So, the president's behavior is of lesser consideration, but it's not insignificant. In each of the groups, we ask people, how do you feel when you see the president on your device or you see him on TV? What, what emotion comes to mind for you in your feeling about him? This is what we learned in that group. I'm happy, I guess. Feel confident. A little embarrassed that I voted for him. I would say confident, but sometimes a little cringeworthy. Embarrassed was the first thing that came to mind. Supportive. Be confident. Embarrassed. Critical, George. Distrustful. Disgusted. So just to be clear about who's who, the last four are the Romney-Clinton voters in that group. The first seven are the Obama-Trump voters. So you see the full, in, the Romney-Clinton voters, the last four, across the board negative. The first seven, the Obama-Trump people, a wide range, all the way from happy and confident down to embarrassed. Now I'm going to start talking about your issue and, spend, and concentrate on that for, for several minutes. The president remains strong on trade, and I'll explain why in a minute. But immigration is the hot button for them, not trade. These two issues are opposite sides of the same America first coin. I was thinking I wanted to ask all of you a question, so let me pose it to you. How many of you would say that you work on trade but you do not work on immigration as an issue. So most of you. For the people I'm talking to, for the people I'm interviewing around the country, immigration and trade are inextricably linked. They are two sides of the exact same coin. Let me explain what's happening. First, I'm going to focus on immigration. Let me play a clip from Warren, Michigan. This is Macomb County outside Detroit, the classic Reagan Democrat county. This focus group took place last July when the migrant crisis was going on. I want you to hear what happened here and then where the conversation went. So what, so what should we be doing about all those people coming to the, to the Set border? Home. Send right back home. Send them home. You can only have so many people come in the country at once. Mm -hmm. I'm asking this week, politically speaking, was a disaster for President Trump. Is that true or false? Among the voters who matter most, the swing voters in the upper Midwest, this was a great week because the president reinforced what he's doing to protect them. Is Michigan unique among the swing voters that you've interacted with across the country thus far? 
Uh, they are not unique at all. These are people who really very seriously think that Americans are not being put first, that the, the benefits are being given to people from outside the country at their own expense, and they resent it. And the thing for them is uh, they want to build a wall. They want to send people back to where they came from. They think that giving people food and shelter only encourages more people to come here. And from their perspective, the only thing that stands between them and the migrants coming to their community is President Trump. So let's talk about trade as the flip side of this. So it is not a key voting issue. Immigration is a voting issue. They are more familiar with trade negotiations with China than they are about USMCA. I asked month after month who had heard about USMCA, and I got a bunch of blank stares. Most people had never heard that of USMCA, didn't know there were negotiations going on around USMCA. It was a, comp I know some of you worked on this and work around it for, for years. This was not something that hit their radar screen. Let me show you what happened in a little conversation about, uh, about trade in Wilkes-Barre. And listen carefully to the sound effects here. How many of you have been helped or know someone who has been helped by the president's trade policies? Any of you? How many of you know someone who personally who's been harmed by the president's trade policies? Any of you? None of you. This has happened to me month over month over month. I've had a handful of people who have told me they knew somebody personally who'd been helped or harmed. Now, Wilkes-Barre, okay, that's not necessarily a farming community. I've been all over Iowa doing this work, Minnesota, Michigan. These, this issue has not penetrated the consciousness of these swing voters. Very few of them know anybody who's worked on this issue or been affected by this issue, positively or negatively. This answer, the third woman on the left, is going to give you I, probably the best distillation of, of, of swing voter trade sentiment that I've heard anywhere. It seems like this trade issue for most of you is a non-starter. It's not affecting the way you vote. Am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. For most of you, it's not particularly up there as a priority. Okay. But you see, most of you are supportive of the tariffs. Six of you said that you supported the tariffs. Mm -hmm. Why? Who support? Who should you support the tariffs? No. You don't. Who support the tariffs? Joe, Nicole, you did. Why? Well, because we've moved so much stuff out of America, and it's all gone to China, things like that. When they're sending stuff now, made coated in lead, things like that, that oh, because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. And now that if we impose those tariffs, what my hope is is that eventually we're going to bring those jobs back here because China's like, I don't want to pay that. Okay. So we'll move, you know, the stuff that was originally made in America, move back here. And yeah, it's going to cost us more for the tariffs, but I think eventually it'll even itself out because China, um, hopefully, that's my hope, is that China doesn't want those extra charges on them. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Not exactly the way a trade policy expert would put it, but that is exactly the sentiment that you would expect in terms of the core understanding of the issue and what she wants to have happen. So let me tell you a little bit more about this. Generally speaking, they are supportive of tariffs. About three quarters of the ones we've encountered believe America's efforts to secure a fairer trade deal with China to help American exporters and to protect intellectual property are worth the financial pain from higher prices on imports we buy from other countries. Okay, so th to that degree, they're actually, they say they're willing to endure some pain. But there's a limit. There's a limit to their support. If the US were to get involved in an extended trade war with China and prices were to rise significantly, President Trump could become politically vulnerable. And they told us that in no uncertain terms. Most are willing to stick with the president's trade policies for now. They believe we might be able to achieve a fairer trade deal with China, bringing back jobs to the United States. However, it's notable that almost all of our swing voters believe American consumers are the ones who pay for the tariffs, as opposed to other people bearing that cost. A fair number of them believe we're paying higher prices for goods because of the tariffs imposed by the Trump administration. 16 out of 40 of the Obama-Trump voters and five of six of the Romney-Clinton voters have said that since the September sessions that we've done. So you've got, it's not a majority overall, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty close, uh, at least among the Obama-Trump people. Romney Clinton, yeah, if they can blame the president for something, they're going to think it's bad. 
and they're going to blame him. But among the Obama-Trump people, 16 out of 40 is a sizable minority think that they're already paying higher prices. One last thing on trade. I'm going to show you a dial test clip of Senator Klobuchar talking about trade. And I just want you to see how a fairly well-packaged response to a question uh, was received among the Wilkes-Barre focus group respondents uh, back in January. Focus between the two arrows on the right edge of the screen. If the line moves up, they like the answer more. If it drops, they like it less. Right now, she's at 50, which is neutral. 95% um, of our customers are outside of our borders, and we have to make sure that we have trade agreements that are more fair, because if we can encourage work made in America, every time you hold something in your hand that says made in America, it is the ingenuity of our workers. It is a quality of a product. It is equality of our workers, and it is the hopes and dreams of the American people. So, again, generally pretty strong response. 70 is considered good in a dial test, and she's pretty much there. All right, let me move on. I'll talk about populism a little bit. So some form of populism are more popular than others. The anti-corporate sentiment we've heard has been very strong throughout this entire project. There's support for increasing taxes on corporations to pay for infrastructure, for example. The support for student loan debt relief. And the support for increased taxes on the wealthy. I'm going to show you a couple of clips from Senator Warren. This is from uh, an early debate, and we dial tested this in Minnesota. Focus between the two hours again and see what happens when she talks about a wealth tax. So I have proposed a wealth tax. It's now time to do that. It's time to tax the top one-tenth of one percent of fortunes in this country. Your first $50 million you can keep free and clear, but your 50 millionth and first dollar, you got to pitch in two cents. Two cents. What can America do with two cents? We can provide universal child care for every baby in this country age zero to five. We can provide universal a, a pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old. We can raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in this country. We can provide universal tuition-free college. We can expand Pell. We can put $50 billion into our historically black colleges and universities, and we can cancel student loan debt for 95% of the people who have it and start to close the wealth gap in America. It so I want you to notice something. She's floating along at 70, which is pretty good. But if you look at the histogram, the, that display in the top left corner, the distribution of the people in the group is very interesting. You have a few people uh, in the who are between 0 and, and 25 or so. Those are the three little boxes in the bottom left of that section. But you've got a whole slew of people, more than half are between 90 and 100 in full, complete agreement with what she's saying during that segment. Let me play a second segment from her. This is from Dubuque. And here she is talking about another one of her signature issues. The principal reason has been a bunch of corporations, giant multinational corporations, who've been calling the shots on trade, giant multinational corporations that have no loyalty to America. They have no loyalty to American workers. They have no loyalty to American consumers. They have no loyalty to American communities. They are loyal only to their own bottom line. I have a plan to fix that, and it's accountable capitalism. Okay. My goal this year is to make sure that every corporate executive in America sees that clip. <laughs> that is what the... the business community and the trade community is facing when it comes to the resonance of that message. I'm not sure it's just about Senator Warren. I think it's about what she is saying and the mistrust of large corporations that you're hearing in that comment and that, re that level of strong receptivity. So those messages work very, very well. Let me tell you where there is a problem for Senator Warren and it's something that you've heard about. We picked it up very early. It has to do with Medicare for all. So we did a focus group in Dubuque right after she came out with the dollar sign amount for the cost of her Medicare for all plan. It wasn't just an estimate. She said it was $20.5 trillion. What we did was we put up on the TV monitor this headline from the New York Times. I did not identify it as a New York Times headline. I just asked them, take a second and read it. So they all read it. And then I asked some of them, what do you think? And here's what they told me. 
why are these billionaires and these businesses going to be okay with paying for everybody's health care and not raising taxes on the middle class? I mean, but on them, it just seems so far-fetched that it's, I mean, it's laughable. I, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with taxing businesses and billionaires for health coverage. I feel there's a different way. So somebody's going to have to pay one way or another. Right. Somebody's paying for it. I really don't think that it's a workable solution. If you're going to tax businesses, businesses are going to raise their prices. I think it's a pipe dream, unachievable, and I think she's just trying to get more votes from the poor people and to think they could get something for nothing. It would, it would break this country. Now you have a sense as to why you saw the drop in poll numbers after the plan came out and a dollar sign was attached to it. This is the response. They, they were obviously quite uh, adamant about how they felt. So I got a few bonus issues. I promised you five. I actually got a few extras. I'll just toss them in for good measure. One of them is the environment. Swing voters think that the weather is getting weirder. In all 11 focus groups, people have told me that across the upper Midwest. They are not in consensus that it's getting warmer, but they are in consensus that it's getting weirder. And what I mean by that is that it used to get uh, warm uh, er later, now it gets warm earlier. Uh, the seasons are starting later than they used to. Uh, it used to snow and now it just rains. So they have awareness that things are getting more and more peculiar when it comes to the weather, which to me indicates the early stages of a political conversation, right? If you're noticing that as affecting you and affecting you negatively, uh, it's, a, some, it's the kind of thing you actually might want to start addressing. So to me, that's an early indicator. The second thing is that they're very critical of regulatory rollbacks affecting the environment. So for the last several months, what we've been doing is asking people with their dials, on a scale from 0 to 10, how much do you support or oppose the Trump administration's regulatory rollbacks as they relate to the environment? In the most recent session in Wilkes-Barre, it scored at 4, 4.0 on a 0 to 10 scale. And then we showed them a list of 17 rollbacks. We had them score each of those favorable, unfavorable on a scale from 0 to 10. None of them scored midway. Everything was below 5, which means they were negative. And a lot of them scored at 1 or 2. So a lot of those rollbacks were not at all popular. Then after seeing the list of 17, I asked them again, how much do you support or oppose these rollbacks? The 4.0 went down to 2.9. And I've seen month after month that effect take place just by seeing the list of the rollbacks. So I asked in Wilkes-Barre, what did you think after seeing the list? Why did you like those rollbacks? Because they affect our air and our water quality. Which is causing illnesses. And we don't have health, great health insurance. What was your reaction to seeing that list of 17 items? Scary. Scary. Disturbing. It's greedy. It's real, all the rollbacks are for the big companies so they can make more money. It's just the basis of life that they're messing with. For how many of you is this a voting issue in November? That would be a voting issue for me, yeah. yeah. I had more people in that session tell me that that issue was a voting issue than health care was a voting issue. So if you start hearing more about this during the campaign, do not be surprised. One other bonus. In each session, we've asked people, well, President Trump's slogan is make America great again. If you, if you had to recommend to Democrats what, what their slogan should be, and you had to use the same construct, fill in the blank, make America what again? Let me show you what people told me. Make America what again? Make it America again. Make America yeah. America again. Fair. Make America fair again. Ethical. Ethical again. Strong again. Secure. Secure. I'd go with fair. Fair. Healthy. Healthy. Proud. Proud. Moral. Moral. Make America equal again. Make America inspired again. Inspired again. Normal. Normal. Passionate, I would guess. Passionate. Make it America again. Make yeah. America oh. America I'm again. Still yeah. on. Make it fair. <laughs> make America fair again. Normal. Make it normal. normal. I say whole. Whole? Yeah. Let's make America America again. Yes. All right. We all have an image but, of what America is supposed to be. Okay. So you see they're all over the place. There's no consensus over what specific thing they want. They're all aspiring to different things. And I would argue that this is one of the key challenges for Democrats, which is that they're united in wanting to beat President Trump, but they're not united in specifically what they want America to be again. They all have different things that they're aiming toward. And the last thing is, Impeachment. Let me just share a quick snippet of what happened when I asked about impeachment when I was in Ohio. Here in Ohio, <coughs> hearing what's going on in Washington when it comes to impeachment. Sad that they're so focused on it. A, a big distraction of what we could be doing as compared to what we are doing. I'm angry. Beat Trump at the ballot box. It shows to me that they're that 
these people are completely out of touch with everyday, regular Americans' lives. If I could summarize their feeling about impeachment, they're asking themselves one question. What about me? How come you're not focused on what matters to me, the issues that matter to me? You're so consumed with impeachment that you can't manage to do anything else. And since what little bit of news they get is about impeachment, they think Congress is at a standstill, can't do a darn thing. And by the way, costing them millions and millions of dollars in tax dollars to deal with the problem that they see as a foregone conclusion to begin with. All right. So just to recap, here's my argument. We have to pay a lot of attention to people who don't pay much attention at all. That's our challenge for 2020. Most of the folks are still in President Trump's camp. You saw about two thirds, roughly, of the Obama Trump voters. The economy is crucial for 2020. Don't let anything distract you from that. Unless there's some crazy foreign affairs event that is just so over the top and President Trump so overreacts to it that people can't help but change their mind about him. And that has not happened yet. The thing that is going to drive the outcome of this election is going to be the economy. There's a very strong America first mindset. You saw that on immigration to a lesser degree on trade. Populist ideas are taking hold with that one key exception of Medicare for all. The sleeper issue, I think, is the environment and regulatory rollbacks. There's no consensus on make America great again. And impeachment is a total non-starter. If you want to know why you're the only folks in America who walk into somebody else's office and see the impeachment hearings on TV, it's because of what you just saw. Normal people are not watching the impeachment hearings. In fact, I came up with an analogy about this over the weekend. If you folks had known on Sunday morning, going back to the Super Bowl, that Kansas City would win the game and that you'd already watched all the commercials, would you have watched on Sunday evening? <laughs> the answer is no. That's what their reaction is to impeachment. All right. One last clip, just for entertainment purposes, and then Kimberly will come up and join me. Bottom line, you've now been in Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Iowa. What's the one big takeaway that you have found from swing voters in those states? The big takeaway is this. Uh, swing voters feel about President Trump the way the royal family feels about Prince Harry. And that is they love him, they support him, but if he, go, if he goes totally off the rails, they'll leave him there. <laughs> They'll That's leave him the in Canada if he, if, if he goes totally off the rails. There you go. All right, so with that, a um, little bit of just follow on. This is where we're going for the rest of the year. That's the list of uh, locations. A couple of them might change based upon circumstances changing in, in those states, but for the most part, I think that's where we're headed. And then a couple quick things. For those of you who are interested in following where I'm going, swingvoterproject.com is the place to sign up to get our monthly free updates. We produce a PDF report every month of all the key findings. Those are available for the, for, the, for the taking. They'll be emailed to you right after we come back from the field. Each month, we also create, and you saw a couple of snippets, of a highlights video, five to 10 minutes of the key things we learned in our two hour plus sessions with these respondents. I would encourage you to, to sign up and, and, and uh, get the reports, watch the videos, uh, forward them to your friends. Uh, the goal here is for this to be disseminated as far and wide as possible, and again, for Americans to not be surprised by the outcome. The other thing is if uh, you want to talk to me, have any follow-up questions, or you want to talk about the presentation any other way, just give me a shout, rich at engages.com. I'd be happy to talk to any of you about what I shared today in more detail. And with that, I guess my friend Kimberly is going to come back up and we'll have a conversation. Thank you. Um, well, thanks again for that presentation. It's the second time I've seen it, and I learn more every time. So thank you so much. Um, you know, the one thing I was thinking through the whole thing is, how does Bloomberg play in mm -hmm. to this race? Um, given that he's gotten in late, he wasn't really big in Iowa, but uh, would love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So we've asked about Mike Bloomberg the last two months. We were in Saginaw in December and in Wilkes-Barre, as you saw, in, in January. And... Saginaw folks had very little familiarity with him at all. Wilkes-Barre, much more. And that was in part due to the fact that Wilkes-Barre is not terribly far from New York City. 
is obviously in northeastern Pennsylvania, so it's not quite commutable, but mm -hmm. Bloomberg was around and present, I guess, for enough of the 12 years he was mayor that there was greater awareness of him. The, I think the most interesting comment I heard about uh, Bloomberg, and we showed them ads in each location that Bloomberg had just created. One of the respondents in Wilkes-Barre said that he was, it was notable that he hasn't seen grassroots support for Bloomberg yet. Okay. He's seen a billionaire spending massive amounts of money on this advertising. So look to him. He didn't use these terms. I'm using them now. It looked more grass tops than grassroots. And you think about the genius of President Trump's campaign in 2016. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with his policies. I'm just talking about the genius of the way he ran was to show from the very outset that there was strong grassroots support for him as a candidate because thousands and thousands of people turned out for him night after night. They haven't seen that with Bloomberg. So I think for Bloomberg to build credibility over time, he has to show that real people are out there in the field supporting him. And that's an interesting contrast between him and the president. Okay. Um, you know, kind of going back to trade policy a little bit, obviously not a huge issue among swing voters, but do you think they've, they think the president has delivered on his trade promises? Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. So, because he's, the, again, the measurement of whether he's, doing what they want mm -hmm. is not necessarily the passage of agreements. It's the continuity of the messaging that shows that he's on the case. Again, they're not reading white papers from Brookings and Heritage on trade, right? right. What they're doing is they're hearing him talk about, well, I got this new deal through. I promised it to you. I fulfilled it. I got this other deal through. So if they're getting a little bit, it's like, oh, he's making progress. They're not looking yeah. at the actual economic effect effects per se. So yeah, for him, it's working. Yeah. Well, I mean, what the panel before lunch, you know, talked a little bit about is the era of comprehensive trade deals over? Does it really matter? Um, you know, W2 aside, it certainly seems that that's the direction going because voters aren't, you know, looking for that big deal. They're looking for, are you making progress? Are you signing agreements? Would you, would you agree to that with that? I mean, how do you see the direction of trade policy going given your work in the field and, and the turn that President Trump has taken? Well, I think the president has a strong hand to try to negotiate additional trade agreements, move forward with China and so mm -hmm. forth, because the folks in the swing districts are supportive of him generally and supportive of him on this policy, even mm -hmm. though it's not a high priority policy. Okay. Um, maybe we'll take a couple of questions from the Absolutely. audience as well, since we've, we've got, got about time. 10 minutes or so. Yes, sir, in the middle. Yes. Um, are these trades that you think setting uh, of uh, President Trump transferable? In other words, will this help or hurt candidates down ticket? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, in terms of, are there specific ones you wanted to ask about, or? Well, I'm basically like, you know, I mean, the Senate is, is being written this town is very, we look, we look at it very strongly. And I just, I'm just wondering for some vulnerable Republicans who, um, that if, if, if some of these trades get signed, are they, is it going to help or hinder Again, we, it's, it's far out. I do not know. Uh, generally, generally speaking, a strong economy tends to benefit the incumbent. If the president is bringing more people in who either didn't vote the last time or, uh, or voted for him the last time and, and Democrats are trying to peel them away and they're not getting peeled away in as large numbers, then potentially that could be very good for Republicans in trying to hold the Senate. Mm -hmm. But we don't know how many Democrats are going to turn out. You know, depending upon which network you watch, you think there's going to be an unprecedented tide of Democrats flocking to the polls in November. That might be the case. We don't know how many, quote, hidden Trump voters there are that Brad Parscale is going to be able to ferret out. He claims that there are millions of people who should have voted for the president last time but did not, and he has t tools to try to get them to the polls. So this, it's, it's always the big fight between is it, a, is it a turnout election or is it a fight over the swing voters? And to me, the really important question is, is it likely that you will have two-thirds of these swing voters going for the president, but that the Democrats could overwhelm that tide with sheer numbers of people on the base coming out in a way that maybe they didn't in 20, 2016? And I don't know. It seems less likely to me than another scenario, which is that swing voters will swing, let's say, toward the president, and more Republicans turn out than we expect to because things are going well and they want another four years of it. And they want to award him that for doing what they see he's done since he became president. But again, 
again, crystal ball, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. The thing to watch again is the economy. If the economy starts slipping, uh, all bets are off. To me, that's the most important indicator of all of this. I, mean, I, I turned 55 in a couple weeks. I'm old enough to remember Jimmy Carter in his last year, what happened to him, George H.W. Bush in his last year, what happened to him after uh, the, Iraq, the Gulf War. So again, I don't think any president is immune from a recessionary economy affecting their election outcome. Yes, Bill. trade issues out there. Have you found anybody in any of your um, um, focus groups who support a 25% tariff on cars? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, good to see you, Bill, by the way. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, uh, it, no, th there, th some of those tariffs are fine in theory because you're trying to negotiate the outcome that the president wants, but nobody wants to pay much higher prices for any of the consumer goods that they buy, including automobiles. And I think that's the thing you have to keep in mind. There's a, there's a willingness to, to get behind what the president's trying to do because they think it, it requires a structural response that requires perhaps some sacrifice on the part of Americans to pay more in order to get better deals. They're willing to concede that much. But if it really starts to pinch, they've gone too far. So basically they support him using it as leverage, but not if it if it starts to harm them, you know, if, if they start to really feel it, I mean, really feel it, mm -hmm. you know, it's suddenly you can't afford things that you commonly buy, clothing, for example, mm -hmm. that's where they're going to say, wait a second, you know, it's, it's really hurting. They've noticed increases, but I'm not hearing organic to your point. I'm not hearing mm -hmm. organic, oh, oh, my God, I can't believe how expensive such and such is. It's, it's not like, you know, uh, Jerry Ford, whip inflation now, we're all so hyper-focused on inflation. We're not. So that has not happened. Any other questions? Yes, right. Or. I have a question in your uh, focus groups. Has the marketing of any American companies towards shifting manufacturing back to the states come up at all? Where they're saying, I would pay more for a company that's advertising, I built this in America. Uh, is that tying in at all to some of this political conversation? That's a wonderful question. It has not come up. It has not. I, I should start asking about it. Do you know of any companies that have promised that and that you're willing to give their, your business to them because they have promised that? In fact, I'm, when I go to Florida in, in a few weeks, I'll add that to the list. Thank you. Um, and I think in the back and then up here. Uh, I apologize if I missed it, but uh, have you uncovered any situations when there were Trump voters who were turned off by something? And if yes, then what was this something? Okay. That's a great question. So you saw when I asked, how does he make you feel? Some of them said embarrassed, cringeworthy. So some of his personal behavior is upsetting to some of those Obama-Trump voters. I think to better understand what's going on, there are, not to overgeneralize, but there are two types of Obama-Trump voters. There are Obama-Trump voters who voted for Trump because they could not stand Hillary Clinton. And then there are Obama-Trump voters who actually wanted President Trump. The first category of the ones the president is far more likely to lose because they were hoping for something better, they didn't get what they expected, and that's what they have to, that's the one third who would go back to President Obama. But the two-thirds who wanted President Trump, roughly, they've got what they wanted. The other thing I just want to share quickly about this also is that a number of these voters are change voters. Now, some people are liberals. They vote for liberal candidates. Some people are conservatives. They vote for conservative candidates. A number of these people vote for change. I like to describe them as serial presidential monogamous. <laughs> so they dated Bush for eight years. They got sick of him. And they started to date somebody totally different, Barack Obama. They dated him for eight years, I got sick of him, and now they're dating President Trump. And for me, the question is, is it a four-year or an eight-year relationship that they're committing to? <laughs> That's what we're trying to find out. Yeah, Philip Chow, uh, Experiential Wealth. Uh, a question for you, just a thought experiment. If you know what you know, and it is November last year, 
and you were hired by China, Europe, and say, we don't want to respond to Trump anymore because we know that these voters are really pocketbook voters. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much pain they are willing. To, I mean, it's one thing to say it. It's another, way, another thing to feel it. Mm -hmm. So let us not make a deal at all. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep the pressure on. He wants to, build, he wants to bring another 25%. Go ahead. How, uh, would you make that recommendation, knowing what you know? Because what you have talked about is really from an American <laughs> perspective, which makes perfect sense. Uh -huh. But if we flip it and say you are advising somebody other than Americans, what would you say based on what you know? Wow, that's that's a, a tough one. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a great hypothetical. So if I were advising the Chinese government, for example, which I am not, by the way, just for the record, uh, I, I think that th if the Chinese were willing to stick with their position and make things increasingly uncomfortable for the president and make prices go up in particular, and that were a function of that policy, then that would probably be in the long-term interest of China to do that. But it have to be really uncomfortable, not kind of uncomfortable. But then what happens if President Trump gets reelected and he's unencumbered by? That's exactly it. Voters. So you can game this out, and there are all kinds of, of outcomes that Kimberly can forecast. Yes. Um, I, I, in the back, and then I think we'll, we'll go over here next. My name is Nate with VDP. Has infrastructure or any feedback on infrastructure come up in conversation? Mm. We have ports, bridges, has to do with trade, moving goods and services. Have you gotten any feedback on that? Yes. The feedback is they want big companies to pay for it. Don't tax me. They're the ones who use it. They have all the money. It's the Willie Sutton thing all over again. That's exactly what they want. Interesting. Which is interesting because on the trade side, they're willing to bear a little bit of the brunt of tariffs if you can get some benefits down the road. But is that because it's seen as more temporary versus permanent tax increases to pay for infrastructure here? Well, well infrastructure also, I've done a lot of message testing over the years on infrastructure. And the challenge of infrastructure is that most people I interview do not want to spend more money on infrastructure. They want to spend the money that's already committed to it more wisely. Mm. So that's a mindset about infrastructure that I've seen consistently over many years. Trade is a different animal because mm -hmm. of what we just talked about before. Right. Uh, yes, right over here. Thanks. Uh, Michelle DeGretello with Anchor Consulting. So it's been my experience that um, most voters are generally single issue voters, right? I mean, you have a few that are in, in the informed <coughs> and the uninformed, you know, hmm. the, the information deserts. Have you talked to them about some of those other really polarizing issues like Second Amendment, reproductive rights, like foreign interference in the elections and taxes? Mm -hmm. Yes. We, so I ask in each session, what is the number one issue for you going into the election? What you hear disproportionately are the economy and jobs, immigration, and health care. Those come up, I think, most often. But you'll hear about pot legalization. For, that's come up as a top issue. Foreign affairs, use of the military. What doesn't tend to come up is impeachment, for example. We, we, I'll get a straight response here or there about abortion or guns. For a few people, that's an issue. Uh, and for a few people, it's a top issue. For many people, it's a secondary or a tertiary issue. But for most of the respondents, it's in the realm of the answers I just suggested. So it doesn't mean that those issues don't matter to people. They do, and they're all over the place, because naturally, these are voters who are in the middle. Yes, in the back. Hi, I'm Jeannie Salo with Schneider Electric. Um, Rich, this has just been really interesting, so thank you so much for the presentation and the data, and I did sign up for the newsletter. Um, so this is perfect topic for after lunch to keep us awake. Uh, very juicy. I wanted to ask you, how much of your you know, analysis do you think changes or is refined when you actually have a Democratic nominee? Because if this is the less informed, you know, these are the swing voters, they're not informed. They don't, they're not focused on who the, learning all these different personalities and platforms and everything. So once they have a face and they get the news snippets on what that position, I mean, how much do you think that's going to crystallize where they really stand? And, and how, do you, how are you going to change your analysis at that point? How do you beef up your groups or what do you do? Sure. 
That's, that's a wonderful question also. I, what we'll do is that hypothetical, the uh, Trump versus Obama, Trump versus Hillary Clinton, there'll be a third question, Trump versus the nominee or the pres presumptive nominee as the months proceed or when there are a couple, two or three ones who are leading the pack. Because what I want to know is if you assume that sort of their attitude vis-a-vis -vis Obama is the high water mark and perhaps the, toward Hillary Clinton is the low water ma mark, where does this nominee fall? Are they more disposed toward thinking that, oh, it's like another Hillary you've nominated, there's no way I'm gonna vote for this person? Or is it, well, like Obama, and I liked Obama, I voted for him once or possibly twice, um, that person is more reminiscent of Obama, maybe I'll give him or her a chance. That's what I wanna try to understand a lot better. This, this uh, lack of awareness about the also-rans, it's interesting now, because I was curious when we started, at what point does high-level awareness kick in? And I've yet to find it. So I'm curious over the next month or two, will I find it, at least among some of these candidates? Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but so far it really has not manifested. But I want to understand that dynamic. And I also want to understand the dynamic between the core elements of President Trump's policies and the core elements of the likely nominee's policies. If you do a head-to-head -head comparison of policies, where do people come out, given choice between column A and column B? That to me is important. Also to understand the personalities and how they feel about how that person should deal with President Trump and also how President Trump should deal with that person. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, right here in the front. This one. And while we get you a mic, well, I'll, I'll end. I'm gonna Go ask ahead. you about, so in light of all of this, who do you think, if you had a bad, is gonna win the Democratic nomination? <laughs> uh, honestly, I have no clue. Really? I have no clue. Um, if you'd asked me, maybe in September, October, I thought perhaps uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh -huh. but then the Medicare for All thing started really harming her. Yeah. And I was also picking up some negative feelings about her personality-wise from the respondents, some of the focus groups, and I, so I dialed that back. But who's taken that place? I have absolutely no idea. Very interesting. So one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly ask you if um, the Electoral College came up at all within the swing voters. Oh, that's interesting. In the context of... Of um, with their perception of it, or if they um, have any particular preference in in that topic. We r I haven't asked much about the electoral college. One thing I can tell you, and I'll just leave you with this one thought, is that these voters, however much here in D.C., we are obsessed with understanding them and talking about them and talking about their states. When I talk to them, they don't see themselves as being particularly special at all. They don't, I can just get the vibe in the room that they don't necessarily internalize the idea that they're the ones who drove the outcome of the last election. They just happen to be voters. So, which is nice, there's a humility to this. It's not like, you know, banging their chest, I'm a swing voter, pay attention to me, pay attention <laughs> to me. They don't, they don't behave that way. It's exactly the opposite. It's sort of the upper Midwest kind of humble, low key way of looking at things and they're just amazing. I, I, I wish all of you could come and watch some of these sessions in person just to see what this experience is like. I'm very privileged, I feel very privileged to have this opportunity and also to share it with all of you today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rich.